Hi, Cameron Knight here with you again with another camera overview, vintage camera overview. Today, we're going to look at the wow, 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 Zorky 4K, which was made in Russia. It is a Russian rangefinder. It is actually derived from the Leica. So let's get into it. So the first thing I want to talk about is how I got the camera. I actually bought it in college. I've had it for a few years. These cameras have actually become much more popular recently. Um, but I got it in, got it off eBay um, when I was in college, so probably around 2003, 2004. And um, I've been enjoying it ever since. So now we'll talk about the, a little bit about the models of, of how this came about. Um, so the first camera that Zorky, the brand Zorky, came out with was the Zorky 1. The Zorky 1 was introduced in 1948 and lasted until 1956. You can tell it's extra Russian by the uh, Cyrillic, uh, Cyrillic uh, type there, engraving on the top plate. Um, <clears throat> I think they did release these with the normal English um, engraving as well, but this one has the actual good stuff. This one actually also has a cool engraving on the bottom. Um, the person's name, and this actually says uh, from mom and dad, basically. Um, and this is a 1954 version. Um, so right toward the end of the Zorky, um, Zorky 1 run. The next camera that came out was actually the Zorky 3. The Zorky 3 was introduced in 1951. Uh, the Zorky 2 actually came out in 1954. So that actually, they kind of went in a weird order there. And then... Uh, so along cam comes the Zorky 4 in 1956, and uh, it actually isn't until much, much later that they release the Zorky 4K. The Zorky 4K was released in 1972. Um, you can tell Russian cameras the year that they were made, a lot of times by the serial number. Uh, the serial number here you can see is, maybe you can see is 77. So I've, I've always kind of assumed, here's the serial number right here. Um, I've always assumed that it was made in 77. And they were uh, made until 1978. That was when the last Zorky 4K came off the line. But the weird thing is that the Zorky 4 uh, was introduced in 56, like I said. But then there was a Zorky 5, a Zorky 6, a Zorky 10, a Zorky 11, and a Zorky 12, all released before the Zorky 4K. Um, I think maybe they just built on the success of the of the Zorky 4 and maybe decided to kind of re-release an update to it. It's just a really um, kind of a cool camera. So uh, this is probably one of the best Zorkies out there. There's a bunch of them. Um, like I said, all those different kinds of models. Um, this is the probably the best one, I would say. Um, I don't have any experience with a whole lot of them, except for the uh, classic Zorky 1. But um, from what I've heard and from what I've read, the Zorky 4K is a really good model. And obviously this is the English... Uh, export release in uh, normal um, Arabic letters, or not Arabic letters, but whatever, normal letters that we use. Um, so we talked a little bit about what came after. So this is a rangefinder camera. Um, you, the focusing mechanism is not the same as an SLR. It uses a mirror, you can see uh, through this little window here, to uh, project an image into this viewfinder, rangefinder combination and uh, you match up the two images, it's kind of a ghost image, and you match the two up and then you know you're focused. So what came after these? Well, um, Leica had already been out, so these came, these came after Leica. So the only rangefinder that really survived um, this glut of rangefinders that was happening in the 50s, 60s, 70s um, was Leica, really. Um, they have lasted way longer than any other rangefinder maker. Um, they've had a little bit of competition recently with the from a uh, Voltlander, which is actually a brand owned by Cosina. Um, these were released in the early 2000s. They made a, a kind of a run of rangefinders, but um, really, it's only Leica. It's pretty much the only thing that survived. But a lot of different camera brands made rangefinders. You have Nikon, Canon. They both made rangefinders. You have uh, a few other Russian brands, which I'll talk about later in the video. You have uh, uh, just all kinds of stuff. You have uh, Contacts, which was another uh, German brand. Um, just tons of rangefinders. They were, um, people thought they were easier to use and a little bit more compact than uh, SLR cameras. They were also usually a little bit cheaper, which is definitely not the case today and hasn't been the case for many, many decades. 
um, since Leica was kind of the only player in the game and they're kind of a high-end brand. So yeah, so that's kind of the, the demise of the rangefinder. There are only, uh, there were, other than the Leica rangefinders, there's only been one digital rangefinder. All the other rangefinders have been camera or have been film. The only other digital rangefinder was actually branded under Epson. It's called an Epson RD1, and I believe they released one update called an, the Epson RD1S. Um, but it's also based on this exact kind of body, this uh, Casina Voltlander Bessa body. These are called Bessa rangefinders. Um, why Epson branded it or you know funded it or whatever, I don't know. But um, one of the only digital rangefinders, with the exception of like the Leica R9 and and the new Leica, just regular M or whatever. Um, and that's kind of why I decided to do this, this overview of this uh, classic rangefinders because uh, the you know Leica M got re released and also the uh, Leica ME, which is supposed to be the entry level version. It's still over five grand. It's like you know kind of crazy. Um, so if you're interested in rangefinders because of that, I just wanted to give you some affordable film options that you could dive into. So here's the general impressions of this rangefinder. If you're familiar with rangefinders, this will be useful to you. Um, so the build quality is outrageous. It's built like um, a unibody Mac made of lead. It's insane. It's just so freaking heavy. Um, the other thing you'll notice that will really make you mad is that there are no lugs. There's no strap lugs. So you can't put a camera strap directly on the body. You have to use this stupid half case, um, like a leather EverReady case that has strap lugs on it. And I don't know if you bought anything from uh, vintage era Russian vendors before, um, but like lots of stuff that's like leather that's that old um, that hasn't been taken care of can kind of like have a scent to it. So not too much fun. Um, so I usually just handhold it um, with no strap or if I'm really desperate, I'll put that half case on with a, with a strap on it. Um, but it's just, it's just a beast. So, um, I'll get to the film transport system in like a little bit later, but I'll just quickly kind of open it up here. So it's just like all this gears and stuff are exposed. Um, like this actual, like the transport gear here actually moves a little bit. Like this thing pops down. See it? Um, that actually moves. Like, so it's just like, you can see like the whole goodness in it. It's so, so cool. Made in uh, USSR, which is kind of a cool thing. Um, so we'll, this thing like even this is like really thick it's like like plate steel or something like it could stop a bullet <clears throat> tripod mount obviously which is great it's kind of like an afterthought you can see it's just kind of added um, but it does with uh, go to the depth of these uh, of these transport uh, or these latches they, it does go to the depth of these latches um, so it does kind of form like a little bit of a triangle like this is set in front of them a little bit So it does make it sit a little better unless you have a heavy lens in which case it falls forward um, So I want to talk about the viewfinder a little bit. Um, it's kind of a traditional rangefinder viewfinder combination um, I'm going to talk about that for a little bit So this is a rangefinder viewfinder combo um, Every modern SL or every modern rangefinder from you know the Canon stuff made in the 70s the Nikon stuff um, all the way up to the new Leicas have a uh, rangefinder viewfinder combination. Before that, just like we talked about with the screw mount versus bayonet mount lenses, there was a separate viewfinders and rangefinders. So I'm gonna bring in the Zorky one here and you can see that there's two windows in the back. So this one, this left one, the one way over here, this couples with the rangefinder. So these two connect and you can focus here with a very, very magnified uh, view. So when you look through this hole, it's like looking through maybe, in, you know, on a full frame camera, obviously these are full frame cameras. Um, it's almost the equivalent of like a, maybe a, a 100 millimeter or like a 125 millimeter, like you're super zoomed in, which makes it really easy to focus. Uh, and then you come, you go from here to focus and then you switch over to this viewfinder, just kind of think, switch over to the next viewfinder. And this is more of a normal 50 millimeter frame line kind of thing. It couples with this window right here. You can tell it goes straight through. Um, it's just a normal viewfinder. So um, that made it really tricky. So eventually they combined these in most rangefinder brands. Um, the ones that survived all decided to do combination ones. So now you have a one window, which is supposed to be a viewfinder, and you know the rangefinder is inside of it. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to actually like show you this viewfinder very well. 
You kind of see there. See that little white patch in the middle where that little line is, that little white line is coming in? That's actually the focus point of my hand. So you can see here that that's kind of what the viewfinder looks like. And the, the rangefinder patches on these are pretty good. Um, the viewfinders on these Zorky 4Ks are known to be um, some of the brighter viewfinders out there in comparison to um, other Russian rangefinders and other early rangefinders. Um, this is a really bright kind of viewfinder. The thing that really bothers me about it, though, is that I'm a glasses wearer. And if you wear glasses, um, it doesn't frame up right. So if you just are, are looking through it with your bare eye, then the lines around the outside are about equivalent to a 50 millimeter lens. So what's weird about it is that you, uh, if you look through it with glasses, which means your eye's a little further away from the back, so your eye might be here instead of here, or here instead of here, um, it looks like a 90 almost, like a really kind of zoomed in view. So it's really hard to frame properly with this camera if you wear glasses. It's just really tough. Now, if you wear like reading glasses or you just have a little bit of bad vision, it has a very cool feature. You have a diopter correction right here. So this right here um, is the same as adding diopter filters to your to your uh, viewfinder, or also adjusting the diopter control on you know the modern SLRs have have that built in as well. But this is old school and it has it built in, so kind of a cool feature. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is just the metering and the and the exposure system. Um, obviously no light meter. This was made in the 70s and it's based on a camera from the 50s, so there's there's just not going to be a light meter in it. Um, you can get, um, there's a VC, it's called a VC meter. Um, I think they made a VC1 and a VC2 model um, made by Voltlander, uh, Cosina, same company that made the Bessa rangefinders. Um, they straps onto your hot shoe right here and it's a really easy meter to use. You can also just use a handheld meter or whatever. Um, so with all Russian rangefinders, it's really important to cock the shutter first before you change the shutter speed. If you do it in the reverse direction, you're going to be you're going to screw the camera up. So if you see here, you can see the little line right here that indicates the shutter speed. When I put when I actually depress the shutter, it spins around. And when you cock the shutter, it spins around too. Did you see it spin around? So that is really um, kind of the reason why the system can't be adjusted pre-cock. So once you shoot, you cock, you can change your shutter speed, and then you can do it again. Uh, this has shutter speeds all the way up to one thousandth of a second, and all the way down to one full second. Um, there's a slow shutter speed section over here, and then over here you can see the faster shutter speeds and all of that. Um, so with this you just cock it and then you lift up on it a little bit and then you can change your shutter speeds and you can actually hear the clockwork working in there a little bit all manual camera obviously not dependent on any um, batteries and then you have uh, your apertures are going to be on your lenses just like any old you know any regular vintage camera with interchangeable lenses uh, these are interchangeable obviously um, so you just it's a we'll talk about the mount later but it's a screw mount kind of job here just like the Pentax so maybe we're a little moving chronologically through the history of lens mounts uh, in these videos. But either way, that's just kind of how the, how the exposure system works. Uh, shutter speed, aperture, um, ISO is determined by your film, obviously. Um, so I talked a little bit about the, uh, the heft of the camera and kind of the build of it. Super, super tough. I love this, like, chromed or, um, you know, silver metal here. It just might be, like, raw stainless. I don't even know. But it's, uh, it's super tough. I've never, I don't have, never seen one with a dent before. I've seen them like scuffed up a lot. This is obviously like in pretty good shape, um, but they're just, uh, you know, they're they're really built really well. The finicky thing is going to be two things: rangefinder alignment on any rangefinder. The alignment of this like triangulation system can become out of whack. Um, I've actually never experienced a rangefinder that's out of whack, except for on really cheap, um, like crappy fixed lens rangefinders, um, but they can be adjusted, so you just have to keep that in mind. The way to check that on any rangefinder camera is to focus your lens to infinity, bang, infinity, and then point it at something really far away, and that's like a point of light. So the moon, um, a really far away street lamp at night, um, something that you can really discern whether it's perfectly aligned, and it has to be really far away because we're focused at infinity, and if your infinity matches up, 
then for most people who aren't trying to shoot like, you know, really spot on focusing, um, the rest of the rangefinder will be fine too. Um, but if you're really picky and really finicky about focusing, then uh, you're going to want to check it at other points too. But the infinity test is a really quick way to just tell if it's, if it's jacked up or not. <clears throat> um, the other problem that you're going to find in some of these cameras is the shutter. Um, if the shutter is broken in a camera, like if it won't cock or if it's a little bit weird or whatever, or if the shutter speeds are off, it's best just to do it yourself, um, to fix these yourself, because they're not that expensive and uh, it's just not worth sending them off. If you do want to send them off though, I've heard from a lot of people on the internet and different places that um, there's a website called fedka.com, F-E-D-K-A.com, that is a good place to get repairs done and stuff. And um, like a lot of camera repair guys won't even touch these, but um, the Fedka guy kind of specializes in, um, you know, vintage Russian kind of stuff. So he does work on all kinds of stuff. It'll cost you a little bit, but um, you know, it might actually cost you as much as getting a new camera, a new Zorky or whatever, but it, uh, if you really want to keep the camera you've got, if you like it or you have some history with it, then um, he'll definitely hook you up. Um, so I just want to talk about the flash capability a little bit. Um, you have the, uh, hot, this is a cold shoe right here, it's not a hot shoe. Um, it just has a stop pin here, which is actually a screw to get into the camera, but stop pin, and then you have the sliding, you know, thing, the shoe itself. Um, you can couple it with the flash using the uh, PC, typical PC flash sync right here. Boom. You just use a normal PC cord, plug it in, you're good to go with flash. And the sync speed on this bad boy is, um, I don't exactly know what the sync speed is, but I would say um, 30 or below probably, a 30th of a second or below is probably fine for syncing. Um, I have actually think I've synced it at 60 before and it's it's fine, it's not a big deal. So that's just kind of an overview of the camera itself. These Russian rangefinders are crazy, right? So 99% of the time, you're going to get your uh, Russian rangefinders on eBay. They're just This is where you find them. And they're really easy to find. You can just type in whatever brand you want, whatever model you want, and, a, and the bunches will come up. So that's exactly what I did when I decided I wanted the camera. So I looked at all the models. You can find different websites that describe the different models from the different brands. And I decided I look, liked the look of the, of the Zorky. And uh, it had the thumb advance, which is really, really handy. Um, I've never used a camera without a thumb advance when I, had, when I bought this camera. I hadn't experienced the non-thumb advance cameras. So that was like kind of important to me. I just didn't want to be fumbling around with the camera a bunch of times. So, um, before Thumb Advance, they had these, uh, this wheel advance, so this is the Zorky 1 again, and you just twist this until it, uh, it goes, and then you pop the button down. So it's just a twist thing, and it's actually, it really does slow you down a lot if you're trying to take, a, you know, trying to capture action or something like that. Um, winding the camera is a pain on these. Um, and the Zorky 4 is, is the 4K is one of the only ones that has a thumb advance uh, from all the Russian rangefinders. There's not too many other ones that have a, a thumb advance, uh, this like a lever advance. So um, that's kind of why I decided on this one. And I just like the looks. I think it looked kind of cool. It looks a little bit more like a kind of a rangefinder that you'd see used today. So, I mean, which in my terms means it looks a little bit more like a Leica. Um, so I decided on this one just because I thought it looked cool. And, uh, you know, had the, the shutter speeds work, the things work, and I just heard good things about them. Um, I've shot with this a lot. I like the camera a lot. Um, but the framing thing really started to bug me after I started shooting with it more. It's just, it's almost intolerable. Um, if, you're, if you're wearing glasses and you're trying to frame with this camera, it's just so, so hard to judge exactly what you're getting in the frame and what you're not. So, um, so yeah, so that's kind of how I came about it. It took, uh, when you order these cameras, they actually come from uh, these eBay retailers in either Russia, uh, Belarus, but the vast, vast majority of them come from Ukraine. So you're uh, dealing with, you know, not a super high-tech country, so they don't have the infrastructure that we have in America or in, uh, you know, Western Europe. So it takes a long time to, for these stuff to get here is what I'm trying to say, you know, and you're dealing with just an incredible distance. A lot of times, you know, you're not flying stuff out of the Ukraine, so it might take a truck to the ocean, it might take a boat, it, sometimes it just takes a really long time for the stuff to get here. 
depending on how they're shipped. Um, I've when I ordered this, it took over a month to get to um, to get to my house, and it was wrapped in like paper basically and like tied with twine. It was in like a normal box, but once you opened it up, it was like in a package tied with twine, which is just kind of a throwback, kind of cool. Um, and you'll know when you order these cameras. Um, you'll know it's in the package because as soon as you open it, it has a really distinct smell. Like I talked about that leather can get a smell. The cameras themselves kind of have a funk to them and it's pretty distinctive. So people talk about that a lot when they, you know, people that really are into these cameras, they'll talk about the smell of their cameras a lot. The last camera I ordered, um, from, from a retailer in the Ukraine actually only took about, I think it only took about two or three weeks to get here. Um, it still took a long time, a lot longer than ordering from, you know, B&H or whatever, but not as long as it had before. So I don't know if the, you know, the postal system over there has gotten better or if uh, the postal system across the Atlantic has gotten better. But regardless, um, it should take, it takes a little bit to get here. So right now I just want to go over all of the buttons and knobs on the, the thing you jig here. So you've got your thumb advance, your lever advance here obviously. Uh, this is your uh, frame counter. You can spin this with your thumb, like you really have to dig in. <clears throat> you really have to dig in and spin it, like to get it back to zero. But basically, there's a little arrow right there, and you set it on zero. You push this around until you can get it on zero when you first uh, put the film in, and then as you go through the roll, you know, it will tell you what number you're on. So then you have your shutter release. This is standard thread, uh, threaded shutter release. So you can use uh, the typical cable releases on here, which is, you know, really handy. But like every camera from before 1980 had these on there. So it's just, it's just a nice feature. Um, this collar around here, um, you can grab it. You grab the collar, not the button. You grab the collar and you twist it um, clockwise. And it goes down. See how it's shorter now? So it goes down. And on a lot of cameras, on a lot of modern cameras, uh, you'll see a little button down here on the bottom of the camera. Exact same thing. So if you twist this, it does the same thing as this button. Does anyone know what this button does? Film rewind release. Exactly. So when you get to the end of your roll, and usually your uh, lever will just stop and you won't be able to advance through the whole thing, uh, you just twist this. And then you can grab this, which is your film rewind, pull it up just to get a better grip on it, and start advancing. And or re rewinding, not advancing, sorry. You'll just start uh, rewinding, and then uh, eventually you'll hear all the clicks and clacks of the film pulling out of the spool, and uh, you're good to go. Uh, so that's the rewind. So, so far we've covered the uh, lever advance. Let's pull that out there. Um, lever advance, film rewind release, shutter, which is kind of mushy. It's not a great shutter. If you're used to the Leicas and stuff, it's not, it's not that great. Um, then you have your shutter speed, which is set by lifting and moving it around um, to any speed you want. And then this collar around here is uh, also movable, and it's... It says like X on it, which to me means sync of some sort, but I'm not sure it does anything. I've never fooled with it before, but maybe if you're shooting flash, make sure it's on X. And then the other uh, character over here is MF. I'm not sure what that means either. And that's that's basically it. So you have MF, you have X, and that's, that's about it. So um, maybe keep it on X to sync it. I, I don't really know. So the other thing you have is your hot shoe, viewfinder, you know, as you focus that little patch in the middle that we looked at will shift so you match the images up, diopter corrector, which we've talked about. So you go into the front of the camera, you have your uh, flash sync port. This is the range finder window. This is the viewfinder window. This is the self timer. So what you do is you cock the shutter you cock the shutter, push this down, and then you hit this button right here to set it off, not this button. Um, I don't want to use this because on a lot of the a lot of the uh, Russian rangefinders, 
the self timer is kind of a weak point of the design so using a self timer um, especially on a camera that's sat around for a long time can be pretty detrimental to the camera so on all of these cameras i do not use a self timer um, if you're a huge self timer kind of dude and you love taking self portraits or family portraits with the self timer um, you might want to just test it a few times before you take it out um, because it, it's just like I said I think it's a, like a weak point in the design of these cameras um, so I just never touch mine I try not to even test them or fool with them at all I just leave them alone um, because just of what I've heard of the self timers um, so we'll go cover the back cover the top cover the front so we'll go to the bottom so these are the um, releases for the back um, normal you know the film cameras you're probably used to have a release here or you lift up this and it pops it open like a hinged door not so much on this camera so what you do is you lift these little tabs up one over here one over here and you rotate them if the lens is toward you you kind of rotate them out away from the body so that you're going this way and then you're also going away from the body um, you know like this on both of them and then you kind of slide it down a little bit and then it pops right off it just lifts off and when you put it back on you also have to kind of line it up get it pushed down all the way and then slide it in okay so there you go so that's the back uh, here's the pressure plate um, you know it's always good to kind of clean these off a little bit when you get them um, but if they're a little messed up I don't worry too much about them there's uh, the locking mechanisms right there there's the tripod the inside of the tripod mount um, you know just if you get one of these just clean them out really good you should be fine okay so here is the uh, take up or not take up spool this is the where your cartridge goes and this size right here this little well where okay so here's the edge of the the area the actual film cartridge needs to go past that quite a bit of ways past that and this little that little open space right there that's for the film cartridge is really really tight on these Zorkies for some reason and on a lot of the cameras I think it's just really tight so a lot of times you'll get the you'll think you have the film in and you'll pull it across and it'll be all like tilted it'll look instead of looking like this it'll look like this like it's getting pulled up to the top here that's because it's not seated all the way in there so you just kind of jiggle it around and make sure it's all the way up against the top you know of the of the you know the little chamber here uh, so here's your film rails here's your uh, you know winding spool gear thing that goes into the sprockets and here's your take up spool these take up spools so on these they're fixed um, this won't come out but on a lot of the old Russian rangefinders they do come out so a lot of times you'll have to find a take up spool most of the time you can just use the spool from a roll of film so if you just um, maybe you can ask the people at wherever you get your film developed if they have a spool that you can use they're just pretty standard but some of the time they're special um, they're like specially made for the camera but that's usually if they're special they're fixed so you don't have to worry about it too much but if you open your camera and your camera does not have one of these don't worry just find a old roll of film put the old spool in there and you'll be good to go um, so you just feed the feed the film across put it in there you know put the leader in there's little slots here wind it on a little bit and then you're good to go so this is the shutter this is a rolling curtain shutter same as a lot of older cameras um, so you see here if the shutter speeds are a little off on your camera don't worry um, this camera at the slow speeds is probably not perfect but um, with modern films you know you don't have to be perfect you can be half a stop off and not be you know too worried about it so the curtain in here is actually it's like a, a rubberized kind of cloth it's really funky don't ever touch your shutter on rangefinders don't touch it because it'll the oils of your skin a lot of them are cloth and you know this is like a rubberized cloth so the oils of your skin can help like kind of break it down a little bit so you don't want to you don't want to touch them ever but um, it's just kind of a weird funky material and you hear that shutter sound it's just a funky funky shutter sound it doesn't sound like any other camera it's kind of like a thwap especially once you get to the higher speeds so if I adjust it here to one of the higher speeds you know, it's like a thwap kind of a crazy sound so um, a lot of people talk about the 
you know, the sound of the Zorky um, curtain and the Zorky shutter, and it's kind of a kind of a unique sound. Um, so after you get your film loaded, we'll just kind of give you a run through of the uh, operations of the camera. So, and then after that, we'll talk about lenses and, and all that good stuff. Uh, so you get your film loaded, you close it up, you can wind it, take your pictures, wind it, take your pictures, set your shutter speed, adjust your aperture on whatever lens you have, uh, focus, shoot, focus, shoot. Uh, when you're done, you'll twist this and you'll rewind the film. And then you'll pop the back open the same way we popped it open, pull the film out. So that's kind of just the operation of the camera. So now I want to talk about, like I said, I want to talk about the mount. So the very, very coolest thing about these Russian cameras is that the mount is a standard, it's, it has several names, just like the Pentax one was called M42 or whatever. This has a lot of different names. So it's called Leica Thread Mount, LTM is the abbreviation for that, which is the same type of mount that was used on the early Leica cameras. Uh, Leica 1, Leica 2s, Leica 3s all used a uh, thread mount. So all of those old Leica lenses will, in theory, fit on this camera. And I'll talk about the in theory part after a while. Um, so what you have here is the thread. All the lenses are threaded. If you buy any LTM, uh, like a thread mount lens, it'll be threaded. And uh, you just screw it on. This uh, is the coupler. So when you when this moves, which is moved by twisting the, the mount of the lens, you know. It moves in and out. See the little black part getting longer and shorter? Uh, that adjusts this, which uh, couples to the rangefinder mechanism up here. So that's really cool, right? So you have a universal mount that's used on a bunch of different types of cameras. So you have uh, this Leica thread mount, which is also called M39. A little trick here when you're trying to put your camera, your lens on your camera, make sure it's focused at, at uh, the closest distance and then try to put it on. Sometimes it makes it a little bit easier. Not a lot easier, just a little bit easier. Sometimes a huge pain in the butt. Boom, boom, we're good to go, we're money. So these Leica thread mount lenses were super, super common. So you can get a huge range of lenses. But the thing about rangefinders is they like 50s. They like 50 millimeter lenses. A lot of these lens, uh, these early rangefinders, you know, the viewfinders were set for 50. So what are you supposed to do if you want to use a wide lens or a telephoto lens? Well, it's really, really simple. You use a auxiliary viewfinder. So this is actually a Lights, uh, which is like the Germany Leica brand or whatever um, auxiliary viewfinder. You see here that it has these markings which are actually in centimeters which are easily transferred to millimeters and then this line here so when I move the line over to here that's 35, 50, 85, 90 and 135. You can get all different types of these. You can even get ones that are just made for one focal length. Um, so if you like using a 28 you can throw a 28 on there and get a you know get the 28 action going on. Um, so this kind of takes the thrill out of the rangefinder though. This coupled rangefinder viewfinder thing that I talked about earlier, it kind of turns it into the Zorky one. You have two different windows. So when you're using an auxiliary viewfinder, you'll look through here to focus, and then you'll look through here to frame, uh, which can be, again, a little cumbersome. So I'm gonna try to show you this a little bit. So basically, uh, we're at 135 now. And then when I twist it, it opens up a little bit, it opens up a little bit, it opens up a little bit, same kind of thing, okay? Close, close, close. So it's just kind of framing up where your camera will be. Um, now it has a type of parallax, right? So you're working with the triangle again. So you have your uh, lens here, you have your viewfinder here. And it's not going to match up perfectly what this is looking at and what your lens is looking at because they're not in the same place. So it has this other little adjustment on the back, which you're supposed to match up to your distance. So you see the little numbers here, this big thumb, you know, ramp or whatever moves back and forth, and it actually adjusts the angle of this. So it's actually pointing at what, how close your focus, closer, far away the, the image is you're 
the subject you're focusing on is. So kind of crazy, they just slip on your hot shoe. If I can get it to slip on my hot shoe. And then your camera looks ultra, ultra funky. So it's just a, you know, a thing you can use to use different lenses. But the cool thing is that there's enough 50s out there for every, you know, for enough variety almost. You can almost buy enough different 50s to have enough variety in your life. Um, so this is a 2.8. So we'll start talking about the, the types of lenses you can buy now, the different brands. So this is an Industrar an industri lens. This is an Industrar 61. And it's called like a, you know, an NA or whatever. Because it actually has some kind of weird coating in it. Um, and that's also the logo for the Industrar company. So this is an industrial lens, right? So that's one company. It's like a, almost like a third party. It's almost like the Sigma of the, the brands back in the day. So um, that's one thing you can buy. The other thing you can buy is Fed lenses. Fed is a, a company out of, uh, you know, out of the Ukraine. Uh, their company, like their factory was called the Arsenal Factory. If you, is this an industrial lens too? Yes, this is, this is also an industrial lens. You can see the actual word in Cyrillic there, Industrar. Um, so you can also buy Fed lenses. You can buy Jupiter lenses. Jupiter is uh, another really, actually, a really nice lens you can buy for um, screw mount, uh, you know, like a thread mount. M39, just like M42. That's the diameter. This is M39. Um so you can buy Jupiter lenses. Jupiter lenses can be really good. I have another camera here that I'm going to talk about in a little bit, but it has a Jupiter lens on it. So I just want to show you the lens here really quick. So if you look here, look at the lens. That's Jupiter in the, the Russian text. This is a Jupiter 8, which is a 50 F2, a 53 F2 actually. Um, so that's just a uh, couple of things. You can also buy Leica lenses. Um, which were at the time, I believe uh, some of them were called Elmar, E-L-M-A-R, Elmar lenses, uh, which can be really cool and can go on the camera too. This is another Industrar, uh, like, an, like I said, an Industrar 50. Um, the lenses are interchangeable. I can switch this lens to this camera, whatever. Um, so you see here, focusing. But the other th cool thing about this lens is that it collapses. So you can push it right into the body. You have a super small package here. And then uh, you can pop it out, and then you have this cool focusing knob here to focus the lens. Really kind of a cool uh, thing. And the Elmars, the 50 millimeter Elmars, also they have collapsible collapsible versions as well. So kind of cool. So there's a bunch of different lenses out there. Um, what else is there? Canon makes lenses uh, made made like a thread mount lenses. Canon rangefinder bodies actually used the LTM mount for a really long time. So there's a great like Canon 50 um, F1.5, I believe, um, that's like super sought after by um, people who shoot these old cameras. And it's huge. It's really pretty. <laughs> it's a really pretty lens. So uh, that's the uh, that's kind of the lens action. You know, the uh, the lenses are just like, uh, you know, I like shooting 50s. I just do. I'm a 50 kind of guy. So. Uh, when I'm shooting with my digital camera, I have a full-frame digital camera. I love shooting with a 50. When I had a crop sensor digital camera, I love shooting with thir a 35. So I like the 50. So on a lot of rangefinder cameras that I use, I, I'm totally fine with the 50. I feel like the 50 is right in the middle. Um, if you're far away from something or if you frame it upright, it looks like you're using a wide-angle lens. If you get really close in on something, it looks like you're using a telephoto lens. I feel like it's like the most versatile uh, fixed lens, uh, fixed focal length lens. Some people feel like that's the 35. Some people feel like it's the whatever. So I just love a 50. So on these rangefinder cameras, I'm totally happy using a 50 millimeter lens. Um, and that's pretty much all I've used on a rangefinder camera. I haven't really used any auxiliary different types of lenses. I have the auxiliary finder because I was like planning, you know, you always plan to buy stuff and I eventually will. But <clears throat> The other problem is that the rain, the, the focal lengths, super limited. Um, using wide angles on a rangefinder is great. Um, if you want to use a 35, that's great. Try to trying to find a like a thread mount lens that's wider than a 35, you're just going to have a really hard time. But there's a simple there's one exception to this rule. 
Voigtlander, the company that makes the best of camera that I showed you earlier, uh, which is also called Cosina, um, they re-released a bunch of thread mount lenses about seven or eight years ago. Um, so if you can find those, buy them up. They're great. If you have the money, buy them up. They're super expensive. They're not, they're not cheap lenses, but they make wide angles all the way to like 21, I think. I think they even make a 15. Um, so there's this, like, they made some really nice wide angle lenses. Uh, the reason why they didn't make a bunch of long lenses is because using a rangefinder and a long lens is a pain. Um, the parallax that you're talking about, like whether your viewfinder matches up to what actually your lens is seeing, becomes exaggerated, and it's just it's just not fun to use. And the focusing mechanism wasn't really built to focus lenses that are that long. They're just not built to be that precise. So it's just it's just not that great to use other lenses. I feel like it's just not that great to use other lenses on a rangefinder. Unless you have a really good modern rangefinder. If you have a Leica, then rock out. They have all kinds of different like uh, things that go on that are built into their cameras to make it easier to use them. Um, but on the vintage ones, stick with a 50. Um, the Jupiter 8 lens is wonderful. There's also a lens called Helios, a brand called Helios, which made some lenses for Russian rangefinders. Um, you can buy the nice Leica lenses. The screw mount lenses for Leicas aren't that expensive. They're not any more expensive than a you know, a new kit lens today, even. Um, you can also get those Canon lenses. The Canon lenses rock. They're so good. And eventually, if you want to, if you really get into these rangefinders, these vintage rangefinders, you could upgrade it to the really nice Canon uh, bodies, too. So that's just a little bit about the lenses. So now I want to talk about the cameras, the different cameras you can get. So you can get the Zorky. Uh, you can get Zorkies like this, you can get Zorkies like this, you can get a lot of different kinds of Zorkies. Um, but there's other brands, right? Just like, just like everywhere else. So there's the Zorky, there's Fed, which is F-E-D, Fed made cameras that look almost identical to this. And uh, they're just, I'm going to tell you about the, the kind of the history of why there's so many cameras that look like this. <laughs> um, but Fed kind of branched off into their own thing, just like Zorky did. And uh, the other main brand that I want to talk about is Kiev, which is that camera I showed you earlier. So here's a Kiev rangefinder. Uh, this has the Cyrillic and the, uh, the you know, regular Western letters. So this is a Kiev, right? I talked about Contax. I mentioned Contax earlier. Contax was another German company that made rangefinders um, separate from Leica. Uh, this is a copy of a Contax camera. This is a copy of a Leica camera. The Leica 1 looks, the Leica 3, they all look a lot like this. But this is a copy of the, of the Contax version. Um, I might do something completely separate on this eventually, but the simple differences are uh, you have a fine focusing wheel up here. You have a, a much wider base here. These are much further apart, which makes focusing easier. So if you look how far, far apart that rangefinder is, this rangefinder is much further apart. Even this one, same kind of thing, just way further apart, right? So, um, and the mount's different. These use up. This uses a very, very early bayonet mount. So, push this in, jiggle it until your thumbs hurt a lot, and uh, the lens pops right off. Okay, and then you just—it's just like a modern, kind of like a modern mount. You just push the lens in, twist it, and it locks instead of having to screw it on. And there's an indexing point here and here on the lenses. You just match up the indexing points, push it in, twist it. It's good to go. So, um, so I just wanted to kind of share the Kiev with you a little bit. There's also a camera called a Leningrad. Leningrad cameras, um, they weren't that great, but they had like a motorized function. So they had two big wheels on the side, and you wound one of them up like a wind-up toy. And then when you shot an exposure, it kind of automatically advanced to the film. It was one of the very first versions of, the, of a camera to do that. Um, so, kind of cool. So now, I want to talk about um, the history of these, the, of these cameras. So, you noticed this was released when? In the 50s, right? The first Zorky was released in 1948. What had happened right before then? End of World War II. So, here's what happened. After uh, the Allies defeated Germany in World War II, as kind of reparation for what Germany had done, 
um, kind of as a punishment for losing the war, basically, they had to give up a lot of their patents. And uh, compared to America and, uh, and England and some of the other big, uh, big countries and allies, um, Russia lost way, way, way more uh, people. Like by tenfold, they lost more people. So Russia picked up a lot of the patents uh, that were, you know, previously held by German companies. So they picked up the patents, and a lot of times they even picked up, like, parts and stuff, um, like machinery to make them, and they started cranking out these cameras um, as sort of a, you know, a boost to the Russian industry, and sort of a, now there's a competitor to these German companies that hold the patents to these, um, so it kind of hurts Germany even more than just giving up um, you know the the rights to their stuff they're they're kind of losing it they can lose a little bit of money now because there's someone else making an exact copy or what could be an exact copy what a lot of people found and why these aren't still made and like as still are is that the quality control was just not as good um, when you look at these cameras a lot of times the fit and finish isn't that great uh, they're not as reliable this kind of stuff this crappy like whatever khaki stuff wears off a lot of times and uh just they're generally not made the same to the same exacting standards as the german cameras were so when i talked about in theory the lenses will match up i really mean in theory a lot of times these lenses just like today when you buy a camera a lot of times it'll just come with a kit lens these cameras came with lenses you didn't buy just a body you bought a camera and a lens kit and a lot of times they were matched so like if someone pulled, like someone in a factory pulled a camera off the line and uh, grabbed a lens to screw onto it to package it up and it didn't fit quite right, you know, they might come in here and do a little bit of filing work or something and then they'd, they'd match them up and make it work. Or they'd just grab a different lens and make it work. And that means that the, not all the stuff's exact. So it makes it a lot harder to, to guarantee that lenses will match up correctly and mount. And the other issue is that rangefinder coupling, that little uh, indexing point that's inside inside the lens there. I mean, that has to be pushed back an exact certain amount for every little tiny step of focus. So if that doesn't match up right, if the lens wasn't built right to match up with that, it's just not, it's just not good. So a lot of times you'll find if you uh, get a really bad copy of a, of a Russian lens and try to mount it on a Leica rangefinder, it just doesn't work out. So you just have to be kind of conscious of the quality control issues, um, but also realize that this is for all intents and purposes, a Leica. I mean, it was copied from the Leica, um, which is kind of really cool. Kind of a really cool little piece of history, um, you know, that involves German patents and all that stuff. So this is the Zorky 4K. I hope you got a little bit of information about it from this video. And, uh, I'm a huge fan of YouTube, which is why I'm here making these videos. And uh, you just notice all these guys that have their little taglines before they uh, sign off on their videos. And uh, I think it's an easy thing to do because uh, it gives you something to end on. <laughs> so I'm going to come up with my own. And I'm just going to say, keep shooting. So, I hope you enjoyed the video about the Zorky 4K. Keep shooting.